The Home Office has been accused of failing to get to grips with a huge backlog of 11,000 asylum seekers who've been waiting seven years to find out whether they can remain in the country. The Public Accounts Committee, which made the claim, also blames the Borders Agency for making the problem worse with failed IT projects and staffing errors. Tony Smith is a former Director General of the UK Border Force and now a global border security consultant with Fortinus, and he joins us now from our Westminster studio. Um, so by all accounts, this uh, immigration problem is completely out of control? I don't think it is. I mean, asylum's been an issue for the department for many years now, for about 15 years. I mean, I think the yardstick on asylum is to look at the intake figures. I mean, how many people are coming here to claim asylum? In the UK last year, that was about 23,000, up from 21,000 the year before, about an 8% increase. If you weigh that against 85,000 that we had in 2002 when I was serving in the department, or indeed 450,000 applications now in the EU where Germany, France, even Sweden are well ahead of the numbers that we're getting here, then I think we need to keep this in context. Now, of course, it's worrying if we're starting to develop backlogs again and I'm sure the department will be looking at that very closely to make sure they divert resources to deal with that but the key to managing asylum is really to maintain low levels of intake and we're not doing so badly on that. Yeah we are being baffled with numbers a lot of big numbers being bandied around and regardless of whether it's 29,000 10,000 it's still a lot of people coming here to seek asylum and we're hearing that some are having to wait for at least seven years to find out where they stand, whether they can come or whether they can go. And we heard from one woman here on Sky News earlier who's been basically in limbo for seven years, reduced to being a beggar because she can't get a decision either way. How, how is this allowed to happen? Well, it's hugely difficult to resolve asylum cases because a conclusion is actually either a grant of permission to stay in the country or a removal. There's no halfway house here. Uh, it's very easy to grant uh, asylum if you're satisfied that the application is a genuine one. But where you have doubts, then the inquiries after me are quite extensive, often involving inquiries overseas, re-interviews, uh, checks and uh, various checks in various places. And, uh, you know, people do tend to come up with new information. For example, as time goes by, they may, may lodge a new claim because something else has happened somewhere. Or they may lodge a claim under human rights because they've now established a, a family connection here. So there are a number of avenues available to applicants which will be exploited and then at the end of all that there is an interminable appeals procedure which can you know can frustrate the case workers because they have made a decision actually it's out of their hands but they're not in a position to remove and then even at the end of that in order to send somebody back we need to get a passport for them we can't just put them on a plane and therefore we have to apply to uh, uh, you know to embassies to, to get documents and, and sometimes they're not particularly forthcoming in in giving those documents or the applicants themselves won't give us the necessary details to get people back so I think people need to understand how difficult it is to actually remove uh, failed asylum seekers. So really where we need to be focusing our efforts is on, on maintaining a low intake. Yeah, that lengthy explanation illustrating just how lengthy this process is, which is perhaps why um, Labour and the Conservatives are arguing over whose fault it is. It's such a lengthy process that no one government can, uh, can claim to be absolved from the issue or, or to, to be blamed for it. How can we make this process easier, quicker, not just for those seeking asylum, but for the government to deal with it? Well, what's the best solution? Well, I mean, I think we must introduce exit checks. We continually have these debates about, about numbers and how many people are here. But the fact is we don't know how many people are actually going back. And I mean, I was head of the borders in 2005 when 7-7 happened, and we did put up embarkation controls then, physical checks on people leaving the country, albeit to try and catch um, your terrorists, but we found vast numbers of of overstayers and failed asylum seekers actually leaving the country. They leave for hu human reasons. Things happen back home. People die, people get married. So people are crossing our borders outbound. And I think we need to get a grip of that. We need to know who is going back. And then we can have a much more sensible debate about how many people are actually staying here. Do you think there's a, a fear of having this debate? Because it is such a controversial and decisive, uh, divisive issue. I mean, we had the Defence Secretary saying that the UK is being swamped. He more or less had to apologise for using that kind of language. It, it seems that nobody really wants to embark on the debate for fear of offending people almost. Well, it is difficult, but I mean, it's a very complex policy area, this. And we need to distinguish between European 
migration and and third country migration. And then in third country terms, we need to distinguish between immigration uh, and asylum. So there's a huge amount of complexity of this. It's really quite important that we get the message out to people in simple terms about what immigration control is all about. We do have a, a pretty good border here. We're one of the few countries left in Europe that actually still has a border uh, with Europe. Our asylum intake, as I've indicated, is reasonably low. Um, but, but we're not without problems. We've had our problems, as have other jurisdictions, you know, where I, where I work around the world, talking to different border agencies, all have problems in this area. I just think it's really trying to simplify the messages to people so they can understand precisely how the process works. It's simplifying it, but it's also making it work in practice. I mean, Capita, a private company, found that 50,000 people uh, who hadn't been given permission to stay in the UK couldn't be contacted. Where do these people go? How, how do the, the, the Home Office lose these people? Well, it's not so much that the Home Office lose them, but people come into this country and then may apply to stay for another year or two to study or to work. That application may be granted. That time goes by. That, that leave date disappears. Now, what you would expect is to be able to do some kind of cross-check against your exit records to identify that that person has left. Because you haven't got a comprehensive record, there's nothing to, to set that against. So you don't actually know whether that person is still in the UK or not. And so Capita are, are doing what we call footprint checks, trying to identify whether people have you know, got credit here or you know, whether there's some other footprint that they can track people down, when it's very possible that these, countries, these people have actually left the country entirely. Mm. Quite a lot of alarmist headlines around today. In your opinion, is migration a good thing? It's a good thing if it's properly managed, but it does need to be properly managed and people need to understand the processes. Where people worry is when it seems to be out of control. And I think this is a debate around the EU at the moment because the fact is, at the moment, the policy framework in the European Union is that we are signed up to freedom of movement, which means that potentially 500 million Europeans could come to the UK whenever they like, provided that they're exercising treaty rights. Uh, and, and likewise, you know, the UK citizens can go and live in Europe. Now, that's nothing to do with asylum or with third country migration. But it is a concern to people when they feel that they've lost control. So it's very important that we demonstrate that we've got proper controls over our borders and that, and that people are assured by that. So is the only way to stop this to leave the EU? Uh, well, I mean, I think there are processes in place, suggestions in place about a renegotiation. But the original treaty, as has been made clear by a number of commissioners that, that, that have come forward, is that, you know, the founding principle is freedom of movement of people and goods. Now, we've interpreted that quite slightly differently. We still have a border and we still check uh, Europeans when they come into the country. They go through our e-gates or through our passport controls and we do watch this checks. Where they don't do that in Europe, they've taken a complete view that, you know, you know, Schengen zone is borderless. Now, you know, so there may be other measures that can be taken place where, where we do negotiate our position with the European Union and find that, you know, we don't really want to stop genuine people coming here, uh, you know, to, to spend money to, to, to boost the economy. And we do want the vast majority of Europeans who actually do come here uh, for genuine reasons to be able to come quickly and swiftly in and out of our borders. But on the other hand, there is a worry that uh, because of economic imbalances, between some of the recently, uh, you know, recent countries that have uh, made it accession into the EU, that vast numbers do come here, not necessarily to scrounge or to take benefits, actually quite often to work, because, you know, the, the, the money that they can earn, it might seem pretty meagre to a UK national, but it's quite considerable for them. And so that's, that's, that's the economic imbalance that creates the, the pull factor. OK, Tony Smith, really interesting to get your point of view. Thank you for speaking to us here on Sky News. Thank you.